Um, and personally, I've just had so many reality shifts. That's how this territory of the Mandela effect is familiar territory to me because I've seen things change, you know, appear, disappear, transform and transport in my own life, including people that never existed being in the world that I know I would have seen before. So, so many things changing. It's very exciting. Like I said, it's an exciting time to be alive. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, I am so excited. I have Cynthia Sue Larson with us today, and I've been a personal fan of hers for quite some time. Her website is www.realityshifters.com. And of course, I will have all of her pertinent information running across the screen, as well as in the description of this video. So be sure and check out her link and her books. You will be fascinated by this topic. Today, we're going to be talking primarily about the Mandela effect, but the conversation will take us wherever it leads. But I want to just give you a little bit of background about Cynthia. And of course, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I'm so excited to have you here. I've been a, a fan of yours for quite some time. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm oh, of course. Delighted to be here. Of course, thank you. So rather than me read your bio, because I will have your bio in the description as well, so folks will be able to read a little bit more about your background, but tell us what got you into this work. Um, take us back as far as you can remember. Tell us you know, how you got started and what you're working on right now, and just give the folks a little bit of background. Okay, yeah, backgrounds, I'll, I'll try to keep it um normal and standard because I can get into the esoteric pretty easily and then it's a different story it's the same story but told with a different vibe a different feeling so the the standard straight story that I would tell to anybody is I was born in a middle class family in California near Sacramento in a suburb to a very um, scientifically minded father but my family loved to travel um, what was interesting um, about my experience is that I was a very sensitive child a high sense perceiver so I'd be seeing things that other people don't see or sense. I've been doing that all my life. Uh, my family was not particularly spiritual, but I always have been. And and we would travel. Uh, this It's important, the family I grew up in, because it kind of sets the stage of how my worldview operates. So my family was very education focused. My mother's a school teacher. My dad was an engineer. We'd go traveling all the time. My, we'd get pull, my sister and I would get pulled out of school early. We'd go traveling the world for like eight or 10 weeks to remote places where they'd never seen Americans before. They don't speak English. There might not be running water, et cetera. Um, I loved it because I could feel the energy everywhere. I noticed that the tele telepathic communion that I feel naturally with the world was very much um, easy to access everywhere. And so it's kind of the basic uh, milieu that I was growing up in. My own personal experience is kind of unusual in several ways because I I actually remember and miss that feeling of being between lives before I was born. So that's perhaps a bit unusual, but it's a big part of who I am because I know it's possible and uh, to, to feel that much love, that much courage, that much fearlessness, that much passion uh, for the magic of existence. So I take life very with, with so much sacred um, love in my heart. Uh, just to be alive is such a miracle in itself. Um, but when I was quite young, I actually wanted to be dead again, which may sound crazy because it was a good family, not a bad family. Um, I wasn't being tormented in any way, but I, I was of that born aware kind of a feeling originally. And furthermore, I had a little bit of memory from a past life in a very dystopian future, which absolutely colored everything I do because it was about 540 years before I mean, after I was born, it's in the future. I know this may sound strange, but I was from a place where central artificial intelligence was running everything. So on the face of it, and according to all the checklists, everything was great, but actually it felt kind of messed up. So a big part of what I'm really doing here, and my role in the future was um, kind of a renegade observer presence. Renegade because I was smiling and nodding with central AI, like, sure, we'll keep everything running. But I was thinking, this is terrible. Humans have no true free will. 
every time they have an original idea, they are, it's like an electromagnetic pulse memory wipe, short term memory wipe. So they'd forget what they were doing. So even if they start thinking in a wrong fashion, central AI would detect it because everybody was connected like the internet of things. Now I can talk about this and there's a language to discuss it, but for most of my life, I could never really talk about this. So my my mission, my purpose in this whole life is to help people understand the true magical influence that we have in the world, that we are magical, creative beings, and that we're here for this. This is a time of great awakening right now, which is chaotic and traumatic and difficult, but it's super empowering, super exciting. And when we're looking at it from the perspective of being pure spirit, we wouldn't want any other time to be alive than right now. So for the last 25 years, I've dedicated my work to the whole concept of mind, matter, interaction. And I've written books by the titles of um, Reality Shifts, When Consciousness Changes the Physical World. I wrote that decades ago, covering the idea that we now call the Mandela Effect, um, in including examples of people being dead and then alive again, just like Nelson Mandela being dead and then alive again as well as a cat being dead and then alive again, and lots of other things changing. And then um, then I wrote a book, Quantum Jumps, when, um, you know, basically it's a new, a new um, extraordinary new approach to you know, having the reality that you'd like to see. And then the newest book is about the Mandela Effect and its society, Awakening from Me to We. And then there's a book about high energy money because people often feel like there's a shortage of money, but there doesn't need to be. There doesn't need to be a shortage of anything. And regardless of what we think we're looking at, we can change everything. And that's really what my whole life's work is dedicated to. And recently, the last five years, I'm part of the International Mandela Effect Conference, along with Christopher Anitra, Jerry the Dark Wolf Hicks, and Shane Robinson of Unbiased and On the Fence. And the four of us have been monthly putting together live streams on YouTube and annually putting together live conferences where we bring together as many scientific and experts and experiencers as possible to gather to explore this phenomenon that we call the Mandela effect where there's a collection of people that remember things differently than official history or mm -hmm. remembering it similarly. So that's that's the big story in a high speed review. <laughs> That was perfect. You know, it's so interesting because we were talking before we started recording and um, there's such an interest in this topic. And I, I, I'm thrilled about that. And I, I know you are, too. Um, I was in a restaurant talking to a friend about the Mandela effect, not in a loud voice, just in a normal. And a guy two booths away came over to me and just was like, yeah, what's that all about? And people are just so interested in it. So for those that don't know, Cynthia, give us, you know, like a 30,000 foot view of what the Mandela effect is. Just tell us what it what it's about. Okay. Some people might think like I've heard the word, but I don't know if I've experienced it. Okay. So you can tell if you've experienced it basically. Uh, some people have these little quizzes. You can look for them on YouTube or online and see, for example, that um, Berenstein Bears used to be spelled differently than what you might remember. You'll find, um, if you look it up, it was always Berenstein Bears, which is very strange to people who used to wonder, is it Berenstein or Berenstein? Like, what's going on? And how did that, why did that change? So it's things that, that you remember and you think like, well, of course, the heart was always slightly to the left of center or kind of prominently to the left is what I remember. And now the heart's moved several times, actually. So sometimes when you look into this, it's like, like, like when I wrote my book, it had pretty much stabilized in the center of the chest. Now the heart is again, slightly to the left, not as much as it used to be, but it's definitely sort of on the move. Um, kid, if you're looking at the body changes, there are lots of them. Our um, kidneys have definitely moved upward. Our, uh, Body temperature has changed, you know, it's gotten substantially lower. So lots of things are sort of instantly changing, almost as if evolution itself moves in these quantum jumps where one minute, 8 billion people have a heart in one location prominently to the left, such that if you're doing target practice at a shooting range, the target for the heart is noticeably off center. It's not in the center at all. Um, I never shot in a shooting range, but someone told me that and I thought, brilliant example. Yeah. Um, and then the kidney, they used to totally be um, 
in the area that you'd call a kidney punch. If, mm -hmm. if you're doing boxing, don't punch someone in the lower back. But now the kidneys aren't down there where they would be in the lower back. They yeah. are definitely much higher up under the rib cage. So those are some physiological ones that pretty much affect all of us who have bodies, and we all do. Geographic changes are a huge, um, like the, um, th there's been observation of the rates of Gibraltar, excuse me. So that I remember Gibraltar used to be an island. Um, it, there's no evidence it ever was now. It's always been connected to the land, and that's kind of strange. So some of the geographic changes can be startling. Mm -hmm. I remember there used to be like, a, there there was a North Pole. Like if I had a globe, I could see where the snowy North yeah. Pole was. So I, you know, I, I'd be a child thinking, where does Santa Claus live? The North Pole should be right there. So, uh, but now there's just water there up at the North Pole. And there never was a continent there that you could ever have put any kind of pretend, you know, Santa's workshop <laughs> sign <laughs> But uh, st stuff like that is huge. And then when you go to movies, lots of us remember things like life is like a box of chocolates from Forrest Gump. But now it's only ever been life was like a box of chocolates. And from uh, TV uh, or magazines, I remember pictures of Ed McMahon delivering gigantic checks like you have won Publishers Clearinghouse. And that's a big one for us Americans. But that never happened. He never worked for Publishers Clearinghouse. Even though on the Tonight Show, he he worked on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. There was a time Johnny Carson brought a huge check, like, ha, 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 kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> having fun with Ed McMahon. And it's there's been evidence of these of this memory showing up all over the place. I'll, I also remember the wonderful world of Disney with Tinkerbell flying in at the beginning of that Sunday night TV show. It was my favorite part where she just go tink and just with her magic wand, there'd be sparkles on the eye of Disney. But now she doesn't do that, or she never did that intro yeah, during any of those TV broadcasts. Oh, and just so, so many, so many, so many men. There are so many. A big one for me was the Fruit of the Loom thing, because I distinctly yes. remember the cornucopia. Like yeah. I, I, I used to buy Fruit of the Loom all the time. And for the kids and whatnot, uh, and they claim that, but yet on the internet, there's clearly people that took pictures of it with the corner. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah, crazy. And then the Haas avocado, I remember it used to be pronounced Haas. I'm from California. Right, right. I would go to the store. It used to be spelled H-A-A-S. Yes, absolutely. Now, I thought they changed it to some unfortunate or made a typo to Haas, but no, it's supposedly always been Ass, which doesn't make any sense. Why would I be pronouncing it Haas? And why would everyone else remember that too? <laughs> so many things. So many, so many. So basically what we're what I'm saying is everything, including our position in the cosmos. Like some people remember Carl Sagan telling us on, if you remember that show that he used to do on TV, he'd say, um, like we are made of star stuff. <laughs> yeah, funny way of saying it. Yeah, and he'd say billions of stars. <laughs> billions of billions of stars. Right. And he'd say, see, we're we're on the uh, far outer spiral of the Milky Way. You know, right. we're out located out on the middle of nowhere. We're not out there anymore. We're we've now moved. So it's like our position in the cosmos has not ever been where I remember Carlos Sagan saying that we were. We've now moved toward the center. Um, and personally, I've just had so many reality shifts. That's how this territory of the Mandela effect is familiar territory to me because I've seen things change, you know, appear, disappear, transform and transport in my own life, including people that never existed being in the world that I know I would have seen before. So, so many things changing. It's very exciting. Like I said, it's an exciting time to be alive. Yes, absolutely. Um, in your book, which I highly recommend everyone read, it's fascinating. And as you're reading it, you're you're having like wow moments, like on every page. It's great. So I again, I'll have the link to where you can purchase that in the description of this video. It's it's just great. It's a great read. Um, you you explain a lot of your own personal experiences in there too which is really fun to read and um what do you think i mean you list possible reasons for yeah. the mandela effect i personally 
think it could be CERN. I don't know why I just get this feeling. So for folks that don't know um, about CERN, just give us a quick rundown of what nefarious stuff they're up to and why you kind of mention them in the book that it could be a possible cause of this dimensional change that we're going under. So take it away. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with what is CERN and it's, it's part of, it's a European, um, project, a very large scientific project. They've got a site called the Large Hadron Collider. And it's um, basically, if you know what a super collider is, it's one of hundreds of them in the world, actually. There are lots of them. Uh, but this is the biggest and perhaps the largest facility to do this kind of research in the world. And what, what they're doing is they're s um, accelerating particles to super, super, super sonic, super fast speeds and then colliding once these particles are going super super fast they crash them together and then see what comes out of it so it's typical you could say this is typical particle physics research and there's a whole movie documentary about it called particle fever if you want to see that you can look that movie up i saw the premiere of that movie when it showed at uc berkeley and there were the scientists right there in person at the event i didn't really want to go but my my because I'm not into particle physics, um, I don't feel like that's where it's at. <laughs> I feel like, well, never mind all that. Anyway, I'm more into the the um, the research side of it, the thinking, the theoretical physics side. So that when I showed up at the premiere, I saw, fortunately, there was a scientist who I greatly admire, um, Dr. Yasunori Nomura, who did not exist. Uh, he <laughs> he did not exist at all when I wrote my book Quantum Jumps in 2013. And, but I, but I love his research, so I was super excited to see him. Okay, I'm going off topic. Let me, but it's so exciting because I remember seeing the movie, seeing him there. He's the best part of it, tiny part of it. Okay, back to CERN and what's going on. What they're doing is they have several projects running simultaneously. To, uh, originally, they wanted to find out uh, about the so-called God particle. And that was the idea of bringing together um, sort of like the, the theory of physics itself, like what's behind it. So if you watch the movie Particle Fever, you can see what they were doing. They got the Atlas Project, all these three projects running concurrently. Now, that movie is not going to show you the weird stuff that people are a little concerned about. Okay, so what are they concerned about? Um, and you won't see it in the movie. It just looks dull, and which is why I didn't want to go to the premiere. <laughs> but but there's something going on, and this is where people start getting concerned um, <laughs> with CERN and the word concerned. Uh, because there are tremendous energies happening in a super collider of that nature. It is the biggest one in the world. And at the opening ceremony, there was some strange stuff going on of the nature that you might do if you're putting a magical intention into something. And magical intentions do have effects. And it, from the looks, I wasn't attending their opening ceremony, but it looked dark. It looked demonic. I'm just being blunt. you know. I, so I don't usually talk about those things, but I know that they do have powerful effects. So uh, whatever's going on there, it's a little bit suspect. And then we, I see, I keep seeing returning influence possibly from CERN, such as um, they had a big birthday celebration this year. And unbeknownst to people um, that I know, Christopher Anatra, board member of our group, Inter International Mandela Effect Conference, he noticed in just on his own this year that there were super big time anomalies happening on a certain day. He brought it to my attention and to the other board members' attention. And then I looked up what CERN doing. I, I, something just nudged me, like, take a look at that. And I did. And they were having lots of birthday celebrations on that exact day at that exact time. So I'm just, I know correlation is not causation, but there's something to yes. this factor that they, they obviously, and I didn't go into all the, the stuff. Um, they've got um, some statues and some other, uh, some of their, yeah. employees have posted very suspect videos there's just a lot of stuff that's a little yeah there is their ceremonies are way bizarre uh kind of nefarious and and just leaves you feeling like right. un uneasy like something right, right you know so what, right. what they're doing and i also heard that they're actually getting funding billions of dollars for another particle accelerator that's going to extend beyond the one that they currently are using. So I, I just feel they're up to no good, but that's just my own personal opinion. Right. On the bright side, we, those of us who are not, um, you know, putting energy and thought and focus into negativity, 
we can influence everything positively. And right. this is kind of what's happening on the planet right now. If you're feeling like, oh, it's chaos. It's like timeline wars. Yeah, I, I think so. That's a good word for it. Yeah. Uh, but the good news is the light always wins. Uh, love wins. So anybody trying to exert powerful influence through nefarious means, that's destined to be a dead end. That's, I we agree. just know, we know that, yeah. You know, it's interesting because anytime people um, awaken or discover their, their own truth, there's a loss that goes along with that because you're losing the old and, you know, what you're used to and it's painful to go through that. But at the same time, it's, it's a positive, wonderful experience because you're waking up to something that you never dreamed possible before. And it's not negative, even though, like you said, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think we can see beyond that into the hope and the love that we do share as humans on this planet. So I, I think it's important for us to be informed about the stuff that's going on. Um, yes. Do you, Go ahead. Oh, I, I think sometimes we go through the chaos in order to ap better appreciate the light, the love, the community, Absolutely. the relationships. It really matters. It's almost like it, it's kind of terrible to feel like we have to go through suffering. But I feel like every time I go through something dark, like I went through long haul COVID, it was horrible. But even yeah. in a horrible situation like that, I came back out of it, which I knew, I, I surrendered to the whole process. Like yes. oh, maybe I'll never never be able to function again. Um, but in that process is a very spiritual surrender and there's humility that's possible. And I think humbleness is one of the greatest gifts, that yes. purity of spirit. So I, I just see the whole thing, the silver lining becomes the great gift. And Gosh. if we look at each, our hardships that way, we can come through stronger than ever. And I know we will. There's so much faith in humanity in Absolutely. each of us. And it's just such a joy connecting with people that are on that same plane as you, isn't it true? Like even yeah. meeting you, I believe there are no coincidences. Things are destined to be, and it's just, it, it's a blessing to me. And, and, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, let's, let's dive in a little bit. Um, so we, we kind of talked about what the Mandela effect is. Um, when do you think folks started noticing this like historically and i know you've done so much research how far back can you date this effect and that people started to experience and and notice it in my book i've got some early examples uh, where it seemed clear to me that is what was happening there may be some a little bit of debate but carl jung had an experience in the early 1900s and i i included that because he went to the baptismal of, um, oh, I forget, the Ravenna, Ravenna, Italy. And he visited it with his friend, Tony Wolf. And she was looking at these, um, at this particular octagonal room with blue light and gigantic mosaic um, illustrations of basically watery scenes from the Bible. You know, biblical stories, very spiritual, the baptisms of um, certain individuals, including Jesus and Moses crossing the Red Sea and things like that. So it was quite meaningful. And the colors were splendid. The size of the mosaics were six by eight feet. There were four of them in an octagonal room with this magical blue lighting. It was it was so meaningful to Carl Jung, the great psychologist, that, that he was um, talking to Tony and sort of expounding on it for about 20 minutes, what the things meant to him and the deeper significance of symbolism in each illustration. Okay, so long story short, um, after Carl Jung goes back home, he re I think I think he looked a little bit when he was in town for postcards or something, mm -hmm. couldn't find anything. And he thought, no problem, I'll just have a friend when they go to see Ravenna, I'll ask them to bring me back some postcards. Well, he asked his friends and they went and they said, Carl, there are no um, mosaics. Uh, I, I believe you, but we didn't find them. Are you sure that you described it properly? And anyway, Carl himself returned later and much to his surprise, nothing was the way he remembered it. And he knew that he'd seen it correctly. He had a person with him. That was Tony Wolf. And so because of the fact that there were two of them, to me, that qualifies as the Mandela effect, which is like a collective. I know it's just two people, but it's a good start. And remember, this is before the internet. If he had been able to post any of this, 
back when, like if the internet was there in the early 1930s, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, I bet you there would have been a whole bunch of people that would chime in and say, me too. I saw yeah. those. Where did they go? They're gone. What? You're kidding. I remember them. Like, and, and they would have stories about it. But because we live in an age now where we can share things a lot faster, we mm -hmm. have an advantage. But I'm including that because I think that's a powerful for initial example, of this phenomenon. Honestly, I think it does go back farther. And Mary Rose Barrington, who's a great paranormal researcher from England, I never got to meet her when she was alive. I didn't even know about her work, but I'm so glad she exists because she was doing research in the area that she um, she called it just one of those things, J-O-T-T. -T. Mm -hmm. And she was documenting firsthand reports like I do through my Reality Shifters website. And she was taking reports going back to the early 1900s. So we've got a lot of written reports, documented cases of um, usually firsthand personal Mandela effects along the lines of a reality shift, but significant and meaningful. And she was documenting it. But when you're asking how early did this really start, I would have to say um, it's probably been around since the dawn of humanity. Yeah. I I would say that there's truth to sham ancient work of shamans who could change the weather. I think they're actually playing with these multiple possible parallel realities. And if they're doing a healing and the person has a broken leg and maybe a moment later they don't. That's a long, I have seen such miraculous healing. I've witnessed it. Now we would call it something like quantum healing, but shamans, I know that when they talk about this through their oral tradition, I would say, yes, that de definitely happened. So then I'd say this goes back thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. Wow. But, but we haven't really been acknowledging it. And right. this is thanks to our modern day technology that we can compare notes and say, whoa, you remember Berenstein Bears too. You remember Fruit of the Loom Cornucopia. It's not just me. And that's... Because it's, it gets to a tipping point when there are enough of us knowing that it's not, I'm not just confused. This is something that other people are remembering exactly the same way. And that's where it becomes significant. Now, now that, that we're, we have the ability to prove a lot of this through the internet and imagery and videos and whatnot, are there any um, scientists that come out and say, hey, there's something to this instead of treating everybody like it's some kind of woo-woo, crazy, high strangeness or something? Like, are there any notable folks that work in, in you know, um, as scientists in this field that are coming out saying, hey, there's something to this? They'll say, they'll come out privately to me, um, but not yet publicly. I'm not seeing it happening because as long as they're employed with an employer who officially is not on board with acknowledging what seems like a paranormal metaphysical phenomena. Um, they, they publicly, they're not going to say that. I would guarantee you that our governments know about this. And so all of the, all of that um, IARPA stuff that we're, if, like, I like to look at mind matter interaction research and when it gets really interesting, then it gets funded by DARPA and IARPA and then it vanishes and then it's gone. Right. But it's not really gone. What happened is um, it's been funded by, deep state funding and, and basically they're saying this is a matter of national security and they're not going to make it public so it's understandable that way however um i think that, that we're they're actually doing a bit of a disservice to the population of the world um, and so then it becomes up to us the citizen scientists to acknowledge that there is something going on here and um, at our conference that's happening this november we'll have a phd um, doctorate um, who just received his doctorate, Char Dr. Charles Labaito. He'll be talking about his research in this field of the Mandela effect. So I think we're just beginning to see the first people who are acknowledging, yes, this is happening. Um, I'll be giving a talk on the science of magical influence mm -hmm. and my involvement doing some mind matter interaction research as a participant in an IONS project um, initiated by Dr. Dean Radin brilliant scientific researcher so he's doing top first rate work and it's not funded by secret money and so that is made public um but still it's it smacks of parapsychology and metaphysics and so and i did work in the corporate world for many years so i know that there's a lot of just um you know ridicule where people think it's funny like haha, we know that doesn't work 
Yeah, that's kind of sad. Again, I'll have your conference information as well in the description of this video. So folks, check it out. If you can make it, I'll post all the information for you as well. What do you think that, um, Cynthia, that experiencers have in common? And why do you think only certain people can, because let's face it, it's it's hard to remember back 30 years ago, what a logo looked like or, or you know, whatever the or TV show or whatever it is. What do you think it is that folks have in common that can identify this? Yeah, I've done some uh, surveys to find out, to delve into that a little bit. And then the, what my findings were dovetail neatly with the findings of a couple of other researchers. So there are three of us coming up with something similar. And what we're finding is that it's, um, if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs interest inventory, it's, it mm -hmm. categorizes, it breaks um, groups of people into 16 types. And within those 16 types, there's something, so, so you might get something like a designation, for example, I am an INFJ, that's um, I stands for introverted, mm -hmm. N stands for intuitive, F for feeler, J for judging, so, but the, the important part, the, the part where it's like, this is really significant, it's the middle two, it's the N and the F. Mm -hmm. So if you have, um, and I know if you take the test and you, and it's a free test online, everybody can take it. You might find you're sort of not really, maybe you're an introvert, maybe you're an extrovert. All of them can be a little like that. And sometimes you might take the test in one mood and get one result and sure. on another day you test differently. Okay, so we're acknowledging all that little, you know, the gray areas. But having said that, if you are an intuitive feeler, that's another way of saying that you're an empath. And the empath concept is one where you know you're an empath if sometimes if you've gone out in public, you just feel like I can't go out in public today because I know I'm a sponge. I, I can't go to the mall. I'm going to pick up all of the ailments of everybody oh, there. It's, been it's not life. worth it. Yeah, that's been the story of my life. Okay. So anybody who's like nodding with that you're an empath. That means you don't have to take the Myers-Briggs. You know, you're an intuitive feeler. Mm -hmm. Ding go, ding, 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 ding. That means you're more likely to experience synchronicity. So Dr. Bernard Beitman, um, he often writes for psychology today. He's a brilliant researcher too. And he's done studies that show people who, uh, I would say empath is the key there. I think his wording is a little different and he's noticing that it's people who are kind of observing themselves but that's another interesting insight to the empath that you're able, it's sort of naturally without even trying to, um, partly outside of yourself and then back inside of yourself. That's how this happens that you go to the mall and you're soaking up you're like a sponge, all this energy, because you're not totally in your own energy field. It feels safer to kind of be hanging out in nature. And like, that's what I do. I love it. Um, so we tend to do that naturally. And we're that therefore sort of observing levels of ourselves in ways that people who don't do that are not doing. Right. And this is super interesting because if you want more synchronicity, then you want to be able to start um, observing yourself more. And for people who feel like, but Cynthia, I want the synchronicity. How do I do it? You can start by just um, practicing something called Iliism, I-L-E-I-S-M. It's a fancy word for talking and writing about yourself in third person. Like today, Cynthia woke up and she went swimming this morning and enjoyed looking up at the trees and Cynthia, blah, blah, blah. So it's all Cynthia, Cynthia, instead of, instead of thinking, I, 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 and, and you might think that's a, such a small thing, but it's not small. It's big because then if I look at how I'm feeling like Cynthia had a good day, but what if I didn't, what if Cynthia was having a bad day? Mm -hmm. Well, this is where it comes in very handy. Now I'm writing about Cynthia's upset. She got bad news and an email and somebody did something mean and there was bad news on the news and blah, blah. So Cynthia was sad or upset. But now, because I'm saying Cynthia was sad and upset, do you notice the wonderful magic there? Now, I, it's, it's instantly obvious that, that being sad and upset, that's not Cynthia. Those are emotions blowing through. Mm -hmm. And it's the gift of um, this kind of awareness, the self-reflective awareness that Dr. Bernard Whiteman writes about. And, this is something that we can do to, to gain power of this I love empathic that. capability. I love that concept. It, it's almost like you, you're stepping outside of yourself and looking at yourself object, uh, subjectively. And you can kind of detach from those emotions then and realize that they're not 
who you are, right? Is that basic? Right. Oh gosh, yes. And it gets, and this is very important now because we're going through this great awakening collectively, mm-hmm. which is another another reason we're having all these reality shifts and Mandela effects. It's big time chaos because all the shadow stuff is bubbling up as people's right. stuff comes up and they haven't cleaned it up. What a mess! It's like clean up on aisle seven and twelve and fifteen <laughs> and like oh, like oh my gosh. Now, if everybody had been doing their internal work, it, I think, and thank goodness so many of us are, thank goodness. Let's be grateful for a minute. Thank you. And it, to everybody who's watching this, who has, if you've done your shadow work, high five and thank you, because you're making it a lot better for all of us collectively as we go through this, because um, it, it's like holding a sort of a confidence and a, a calm, soothing, de- detached, yes. energized feeling of bliss and, and radiance, which then is shared collectively. So even those who haven't yet attained that, we benefit from the calmness and the good example, the presence. Even mm-hmm. if you're not, you might say, Cynthia, I'm not a writer. I'm not a teacher. That doesn't matter. Your field effect is huge. And there's a gigantic ripple effect going on just because you are doing a little bit of your own meditation. Even if it's like, I could do more. That's great. Just Know what you're doing, and it's making a huge difference, huge yes, positive difference. Absolutely, and I love that. I love that. So, like the Mandela effect is like forcing us to pay close attention to what's happening, uh, and it's connecting us at the same time. Do you think? What do you think the reason is for these reality shifts, or w- what's the purpose and the meaning? Do you think behind? Yeah. Okay. Well, this get, to me, this gets into this has been a prophesized um, situation that we knew this time of great chaos would be unfolding. The Hopi prophesized it. They have their prophecy rock showing there will be a time of the first great shaking, World War One. The second great shaking, World War Two. Now they they drew this onto a very ancient rock, hundreds if not thousands of years ago. So this prophecy rock was telling the future of the world long in advance. Because the Hopi know that we've been through the end of the world three times already. It's flooded. It's it's, it's hot on fire. Things have happened. And they said it's going to happen again. And they would be what we would call remote viewing it. And then they Mm -hmm. drew it onto the rock. Like it's going to time. There will come a time of the world splitting in two. And the people that lose their heads. I mean, it, it doesn't say that. But if you look at the picture closely, the people on the dead end trail, their heads are coming off their bodies. They look like little robot beings going up into the cloud, which to me is very symbolic, like really. And then the people keep their heads attached. They're walking, they're getting to old age and walking with a cane and they, they're they still here. The people that lost their heads, they, their little timeline, it is like a timeline. It just goes, poof, it vanishes into the cloud. Where'd they go? I don't know. Um, but the people who are staying in relationship with each other, with their earth, with um, the plants and the animals, their little timeline continues, not just going steadily along, but it goes around the edge of the rock and onward. It's mm. very, it's showing symbolically. It's almost like into another dimension. I love that because it feels to me like we are becoming interdimensional. It feels like um, this Mandela effect is showing us that we have greater ability to change physical reality than we've ever thought possible. It shows that this is like a waking dream that we, through thoughts and feelings and the energy that we feel, we're capable of changing the physical world. Absolutely. Like a broken bone instantly being fixed. Um, You know, I write about these things in in my book, Quantum Jumps, got an example of that. Um, I've had lots of experiences of my own that I do share in this new book, Mandela Effect in its Society. But it's been a global experience. People have been experiencing these things, these Mm -hmm. quantum jumps. So that's what we're we're getting the opportunity, um, coming full circle back to your question, what's going on? And this time, this this jump from the fourth world to the fifth, humanity and this great awakening, we are capable of evolving ourselves and being participants in how we do this. We've never had that much involvement in these past times. This is the first time that more of us than ever before are hands-on participants, knowing that we can we can do that view like Cynthia did this. You can look at yourself third person from the vantage point of a higher dimensional sense of being, which is very important because if, if you look at like the UFO phenomenon, how sometimes they've noticed um, UFOs show up at a military site and then 
the nuclear test can't happen because the weapons were disengaged. Okay. Now let, think about flatland, um, a two-dimensional flatland where circles and squares are fighting with each other. And I'm looking down on flatland. It's easy for me to see it because I'm in three-dimensional space. And so if I have got a circle and he's hiding from Mr. Square and circles in the closet, I know where he is. Well, what if they get, what if the conflict turns serious and now they're fighting and they've set the, the flatland on fire? And I see flatland is on fire and I don't want it burning my three-dimensional world. What do I do? I put my hand on the paper and I put the fire out. Mm-hmm. it's easy and when we go into a higher dimensional sense of efficacy and conscious agency we are the ones that can put out the nuclear weaponry and it suddenly doesn't work at right all. how does how does that happen we are doing that we are interdimensional we are operating with quantum superpowers that i write about in, the, in my new book so it's these are not fiction this is real we, we're able to bilocate we're able to teleport these are things that i've been sharing firsthand reports, if people want to check them out for free yeah. on my website, Reality Shifters, for 25 years. So it's it's not just me, it's a global phenomenon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at the Tartarian, you know, there's so much about that on the internet now and imagery that people are are awakening to. And it's almost frustrating because there's there's like, same thing in the UFO community, there's a lot of infighting so like you know you got the flat earthers and then people are like you're crazy there's a globe earth and you know i almost wish well maybe it's good because it kind of pushes to the surface the topic so you know in a way it's a good thing Um, well not to be a conspiracy theorist but there's been a lot of pressure from the deep state that i was talking about earlier um there is in so there's always going to be this sort of uh, attempt to infiltrate any organization might be revealing something of national security interest. And you better believe this is national security interest because oh, yeah. everything, if, if this is the most important topic in the world right now is this Mandela effect because it's showing collectively we can change everything through basically prayer, like you know, like you know focus, meditation. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, the government seems to get in the way of, of, of so much of it it's so frustrating um especially with the ufo stuff like one month they come out and say yeah there's definitely some type of uap going on and then arrow comes out with a report saying no there's no proof it it it's done intentionally i mean yeah. just to keep us confused and and then disgusted and then people just give up on it and kind of walk away from it but <laughs> but um so um, you mentioned in your book that, and I, I said before that CERN could be a possible theory, but you mentioned that there are like dozens of theories. Um, yeah. You list them in your book, false memories and confabulation, uh, stimulation de- theory, um, CERN, which we mentioned, time travelers and so on. So definitely folks go check it out because Cynthia goes through all the different possibilities. What do you think in, in you, you know, living the life that you led and doing years yeah. and years of research, what do you think is the cause or the reason that people are awakening to the Mandela effect? Like, what do you think it's for? Well, it feels to me that I, I would go with it, the prophecies of, you know, those indigenous First Nations people who said, this is the time. So like the Mayans talked about 2012, which was not, I know people feel like that fizzled out. Not really, because 2012 was around the time that the Mandela effect became uh, a thing. Like that technology showed up right around there. So that's when it got named. That's when people started feeling like, whoa, Nelson Mandela's alive again. I thought he died in the 1980s. So that's a big thing. So because it was prophesized and because it's been expected, like the Hopi expects that we'll go through seven worlds, we're just going from the fourth to the fifth right now. So when they look at their entire timeline of the future, it's a big timeline. Mm-hmm. And that dovetails with, if you look at Grand, Graham Hancock and the ancient true history of the world, Tartaria, of course, but also the 12,000 year cycle, the the cycle of 6,000 years where we've got the magnetic pole reversals and huge changes to the earth. All that stuff could be happening. But um, like I said, the Mandela effect, this topic is the number, in my way of thinking, this is it. This is the big deal because it shows 
that we're going to be able to steer planet Earth, even if our governments are up to no good, and even if CERN is up to no good, it doesn't matter because this this great awakening is happening anyway, and there's no way they can stop it. And in my book, Mandela Effect in its Society, I talk about Project Looking Glass and the and I've been personally contacted by people that said that they had worked for the time travel department of the federal government. And they they told me, you did not exist. Now, that's typical. I would have been hiding in a lot of those realities. Um, remember, my personal story that resonates for me is that I came, I've, I've checked out of future dystopian world, a possible reality that I'm saying, no go, let's not go there. It was 540 years before I was born. And so, of course, uh, one of I didn't go into all the details, but I know how to um, conceal myself when being hunted by central AI. That's right. like, it goes with the territory. That's what I was doing. So for me to jump back in time and um, you know, I, I, it it sounds crazy, but not now because we've got movies that absolutely look a lot like yeah. So now people see like this makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it. So uh, I would say that we're going to be fine. Um, that this is. It's been foretold. The gifts that we're receiving from recognizing the Mandela effect is a gift. Even if there are ma dark magical practices being practiced, we can win just by going with how good can it get for all of us. It's a question, but it, even if that's all you do is just every day, start the good day, ask how good can it get for all of us. You're helping and you are overturning all the darkest arts and all the darkest stuff. You don't even need to get specific. Just feel it with all of your heart and soul. Ask that question every day. And you're joining those of us who are doing that. And believe me, that makes all the difference. That's all we need to do. That yeah. right there. Yeah. And it may sound like that's too simple. No, it's not. No, I agree. <laughs> Is that future going to happen, the one that you came from? In some version, it did happen. I went to check it out. It was a popular future when um, in, I know it sounds kind of tangled, like what happened? When did this happen? Well, it's my most recent past life. I did go to observe it. I wanted to see what would it be like if central AI was taking care of nature, the environment, making sure that humans don't blow each other up, fight with each other, wreck the environment, yada, yada, yada. Can we do that? I would say that particular version of central AI acting like it's God is a definite no-go, absolute no-go, because it becomes self-protective. Right. Um, humans are we're going to have to step up we're going to have to take charge uh, it's okay to be side by side with ai never ever ever put it in the position of god over all of us that was the moment when everything went haywire mm -hmm. and you might say well cynthia ai stole that from humanity it can't be stolen if we don't let it happen and if we keep asking how good can it get which for those of us who believe in God, that's how God can it get, right. um, then that that's sure not, that's not AI has died. No right. way. Elon is constantly, <laughs> and others, constantly warning us about um, not letting that happen. Uh, um, but yeah, so how does religion fit, speaking of God? How does religion, because there's such a huge awakening, people are getting re-baptized and baptized, as you've seen all over the internet. Where do you think religion fits in? It's very powerful right now. And you're right. Um, historically, religion, I've seen it as, um, I would like to quote um, uh, Leibniz. He's a philosopher. And Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz um, from the, I think the 1600s, one of the originators of calculus. So, you know, a long time ago, hundreds of years ago. But what he envisioned was this idea of the perennial philosophy. It's like a pyramid, so it's sort of a shape. If you imagine like, there's Christianity, Buddhism, indigenous um, spiritual paths. They all basically guiding us toward this idea of what you might, what I call goodness. At some point, then uh, it starts off like you can go into church and you can go worship with others. And that's the base of the pyramid. When you get to a certain point, uh, it's possible, and a lot of us have had an ep epiphany of sorts, which is indescribable. And I've had one, and there's no way I could put it in words. And up there toward the pinnacle where you start getting close to that that absolute connection with the eternal infinite. And I think all of these paths converge there. It's almost indescribable. And so it's basically this concept that there is ultimate goodness and all the all the roads lead to Rome. <laughs> they all lead to the absolute. They all go to that perfect pinnacle of absolute sentience and knowingness. 
but I know the difference. I know I'm not God. So I would not say it's all good. It's all one. And I create all my reality. I don't say those things because I believe that you are real, Carol Ann, and people watching us are real. So I don't fall into solipsism, which is the idea that I create everything and I'm the great poobah. That's ridiculous to me. I We need to keep this relationship. I need to be in relationship with you, Carol Ann, and with your audience and, and really feel my love for each and every one of you. And that's the question you're asking. What's happening now? Why is there a return to that? Okay, this gets really cool. What, what I see happening is um, there's a response to this sort of an evil cloud that's sort of covering the earth. And I felt that when I came into this life, I felt like, man, there's an oppressive evilness here. Yeah, and most, most of us, yeah, we feel it because you'll get these intrusive thoughts that are not yours, kind of qu- making you doubt yourself, making you feel bad about anything like that. That's interference. That's basically, people have called it the devil. They've called it egregore. They've called it the architect is what yeah, they did call it. Many names. Many names. But we know what we're talking about. So why are people going into religion hardcore right now? Because they know that the best thing you can do right now is connect directly to that absolute good, whatever you want to call it. Um, Some of us, like I don't need a specific religion to feel like I have a one-on-one connection with source, absolute, the real God, not some fake in-between God that's monkeying with humanity. That's not good enough. I've already been from it to a past life in the future like that. Mm. Believe me, that's that's not good enough. So I love hanging out between lives because that's the real heaven. That's the real God. It's I know the difference. And so we can all have that. And I know that's what people are seeking right now. They're going into religion to one, connect with source and two, right. clear out that awful interference that we've all been feeling, that all yeah. of us who are sensitive. It is heavy. It's very heavy. Um, so- do you think that, because I've also read that a lot of people are working towards uh, lifting their consciousness because they don't want to come back here. Do you think that you have the ability to do that where you can just get to a point and say, I'm done with earth. I, I just, I, I don't want to come back. I hear so many people saying that, that they just don't want to reincarnate. They're done with earth. Like, do you think you have control over that or is is that more just a destiny thing that you, you have to go through? Yeah, I've heard so much about this. I've been part of it myself. When I was five, I wanted to die. I mean, th- I came in feeling like I'm ready to leave. And most <laughs> up until I was about 30, I felt that way. And what's interesting is, as I got older, I'm starting to come to the, to, to resonate more with my um, dead, the way I feel when I'm between lives. I'm feeling more like that now which is appreciating like there's a lot of good that we can do um, because I'm, I'm because now I'm farther along in my life. I'm actually closer to the actual death. Right. Now I recognize like I can get a lot more done being here because people can hear me better. I, yes. I, I'm, I'm sort of an earth angel being. I know who I am. So I know that I'll want to be a guide. I want to be a teacher. What happens when you're dead and you try to have any kind of influence, it's really hard. But you get the attention of young children, old people, and animals. And yeah. That's about it. Everybody else is ignoring you. Yeah, it's so <laughs> true. It's so <laughs> true. It's so damn true. Oh my gosh. So, so do you think though that that you don't have control over whether or not you you reincarnate, or is it just part of your your? Okay. Let's so look. At, let's take apart that question because to answer that. This is now you get into my favorite topic of all time, besides how good can it get? And it's eight levels of conscious agency. So we've got neurons in the head. Mm-hmm. So when I'm deciding, you know, what am I thinking? You might think it's all from my head, but not really, because I've also got neurons in my heart mm-hmm. and I've got neurons in my gut. They've just discovered this. Well, this is the way I've been doing spiritual readings for people for a long, for 25 years. It's because if you take these big centers of neur- neuronal activity, instantly you can get a reading like what does this person what are they feeling what do they need at the level of neurons of the head neurons of the heart neurons of the gut when you tune into those three areas it's like a layer cake and it's it's like a snapshot um you could also do all seven chakras in the body Mm -hmm. you could also do some of the chakras above the body um so when you say something like is it my choice that gets super interesting most people have no idea that they're out of alignment. Um, so like when I was young, I was thinking, I don't want to be here. But was I actually recognizing the 
like my eighth and ninth and 10th chakras, my higher dimensional levels of conscious agency? No, I was not. And so I had a little moment of meeting my guides and having a conversation and and then coming up to speed, like, oh, so it's levels of conscious agency. That, and as I get older, I'm much more in connection with these higher levels of conscious agency than I was when I was five or 10 or 20 or 30. Mm-hmm. And so this is a big shift happening. And so when you say, is it our choice? <laughs> Always it's your choice. Mm. The trick, here's the trick. Most people have no clue, not a clue that when you're alive, you're kind of focused in your seven chakras that are in your body. Mm-hmm. Most people. And when you die, then you get the full thing. And then with the full thing, you're like, whoa, I wasted my life. Oh my gosh. What was I doing? Oh, I want to do it again. Like, and people are like, yes, you're expected to go back. And they're like, I want to, because I know I could do better. And I know it will be a whole new life, a whole new thing, but let's do it. You know, and there's excitement. And so it is your choice. But when you're alive, you're just feeling the boots on the ground misery of like, oh my gosh, this is a slog. And there's so much pain and chaos and trauma and pain, you know, drama and trauma. It's just hard. Um, but then when you're dead, you see like, oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Every single time I was challenged, I could have risen above it. I didn't know, but I do know now I can do better and I can help more people. And there's so much excitement that happens. So yes, it's always your choice. The trick is when you're alive, you're thinking like, oh, I'm just going to cheat the system. I'm going to go to, I'm not going to go to the light. There's a big thing about that whole thing right now. Yeah. If anyone's wondering, what do you do? I'd say go to the light. That's it's just you're just gonna spin your wheels and spend more time in some messed up darkness, and you'll end up in the light anyway. But you'll just yeah. it's gonna be a I don't whole get nasty de- why there's some folks that are saying don't don't go to the light when you die because it'll just put you back here or something like that. I remember them saying, and then like, where would you go if you don't go to the light? makes no sense what's happening they're going to be wandering it's kind of like the hopey thing with the people that get when they when it's like when you cut your head off not going to the light is very similar to cutting your head off it's a dead end right so um it's like well you can do that if you want i wouldn't recommend it at all that's not how good it can get in my humble opinion now people might feel differently that's great then all power to you I i don't recommend it do you think that because let's face it there is evil and darkness uh, in this realm. And, um, you know, me personally, I, I spend every day fighting it and, and just making sure it doesn't enter into my, my energy level and my plane of existence. Um, do you think that, that folks that are evil, that do evil things are soulless? Do you think they come into this world, this life without a soul? Because how could they, Think about the suffering of children and what's happening with children. Um, How could anybody with a soul do these things? What's your opinion on that? Uh, Well, I I don't. Okay. First of all, I have to disclaimer. uh, (laughs) I don't spend a lot of, I know those things are true. I know they're happening. Um, I'm grateful that I don't have too much firsthand experience with all that. Thank God. But but I'm not denying it. I'm saying like, okay, that's real. So I don't have firsthand knowledge of what's going on with that. But, but I do a lot of clearing as you do. And what I've seen there is I haven't yet seen a soulless being, even demons have souls. Mm. Um, So yeah, when I deal with, I'll, I'll, I will clear demons and I'll give them, I give them a choice. I treat them as I would want to be treated myself. And I say, you can go with, they have guides. They may not, they, they, they will tell you, I don't have guides. And like, yes, you do. And, and then I don't want to go with my guides. Okay, well, now we're, you know, whatever. You, you know how the talk back happens. Let's not go into all that nonsense. But um, so they can either go with their guides or basically be put back, like recycled, um, return right. to source. And so, which is not, a, it, it is kind of a destruction. Uh, I would not recommend that. I would say learn from whatever's happened here, even if you feel bad about what just transpired. Because as soon as they come back into contact with their soul, they do have souls. Then they're sort of a little bit shocked and embarrassed and ashamed. And then it's then they kind of want to die sometimes. And so that could happen. And if that's what it's an awakening for them, too, it is. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. I hear debate about that. You know, some people say, oh, you know, um, a lot of the evil is caused by soulless beings. And I'm like, well, how could that be? Because I think everybody's born immediately with a soul. I mean, I've even seen imagery of the soul, um, 
as soon as the sperm hits the embryo, there's like a light that gets it. I don't know if you saw that. There's wow. a well, video of a, a light that it emits and people are theorizing that that's the soul entering the embryo. It's crazy. It's it's beautiful to watch. And, and that's what I believe. I think everybody has a soul, but it just makes you wonder about the demonic um, side of things and, and like why it exists. Because I've often asked um, a lot of people that I interview that have had NDEs and mm -hmm. I ask them like, why did God put evil on the earth? Like why do I we, know. it's, it's, it's a question that everybody kind of wants to sort through and it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's very tough. Yeah. Yeah. What about meeting our future selves? You talk about that in, in, I know we're going past the hour and I apologize. Are you, are you okay with talking a little? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I was fascinated by that in, in your book that you talked about meeting your future self. And is this something everybody can do? Tell us about that. How does that work? Yeah, well, I actually did literally meet my future self, which blew my socks off. <laughs> I'll, I'll describe Bye. it briefly. Yeah, I talk about it in my book, and I've, I think I mentioned it in other interviews sometimes. It was so amazing. I was about 16 years old. I'd gone to bed one night in my bedroom alone. Um, but the light was off. Um, I said goodnight to my parents, and I was just laying down. And then I felt like there was a presence in the room. I opened my eyes, and I saw this sort of glowing, floating being, which was clearly me, an older me. I was 16, and this was a growing woman. And she was just, um, it turned out she was telepathically talking with me. At, at the age of 16, apparently I was talking out loud to her, which um, I didn't notice I was doing, but I was I, I was so surprised. Like, I, I think, I, I don't know what I did, like, ha -ha, like a nervous laugh, like, hello? And then she started telepathically comforting me, like, hello? I think she said, like, thinking to me, I'm you. I'm just here for a few moments. Just so glad to be with you. It's very sweet, loving presence. And I, I, I was so surprised. I said a few more things. She just, she came alongside me. Next, next to my bed was my roll top uh, oak dresser. She slowly opened the, um, removed something from the lower left drawer, and then just continued smiling and loving me with her presence. And she returned to the, when she came out of the um, floor to ceiling sliding glass mirror doors of my closet, and she went right back through those mirrors. And um, and then a few minutes, I was just like, what the heck? And, and then the door opened, and it was my dad, and he, he said, are you all right? And I didn't know. I said, yeah. And that's when I realized, was I talking out loud? And I still couldn't believe any of this had happened. So I fell asleep. And the next morning I woke up with a jolt, like, oh my gosh, what was she doing in my dress, in my um, desk? And I had some very precious to me notes that my um, boyfriend had written, who turned out to be my first husband later. Um, and they were gone. And oh. I know now, now I would realize, oh, she took them. But back then I instantly thought, or some I know it's a jump, but my sister must have taken them. Now my sister didn't know they were there. My sister would have had to figure out they were there, break into my room, have the nerve to steal them. I wasn't thinking logically. I was just upset. Right. And so I stormed. I stormed into her room, woke her up, demanded to know what did you do with my letters that you stole. And she was indignant. She was so angry with me for waking her up that I knew she's not even slightly embarrassed. So she didn't do it. And then I realized, oh my gosh, that really happened. Um, and then years later, I realized that was my future self giving me in advance permission to not put my first husband and that boyfriend that I married on a pedestal and to know it's okay to move on. And what better way could she possibly have done it than to remove the these right. artifacts, <laughs> these things I would have been worshiping. <laughs> you weren't having an, an OB, like an, an out-of-body experience that you were fully awake. That was really awake. And my dad came into my room. So it was like, it would pinch me and I'm like awake, but I couldn't believe that it happened. It was such an interdimensional thing, like experiencing ETs that are very interdimensional. So it's it's it's, it's humanity, again, going into an interdimensional state where right. we can be comforted by our future selves. If you're going through a rough time, you can ask your future self, my best possible future self, can you please give me comfort, guidance, protection, inspiration, and love right now? 
and your best possible future self will be there for you. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. I love that. Um, how do you get in touch with your spirit guides? Do you uh, reach them through prayer? Like what, how does that work for you? Um, well, I have sort of a, I get to know my team. And so I, I um, sort of am aware generally that I've got a rather large team. If if I notice there's a whole bunch of them, then I'm like, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> I'll be dealing with something today because I, I like my team to be with me. I basically every day ask, could you please uh, bless and protect me and everybody and everything I love? And so it's just, like you said, I'm just right there on that same page with you. The most important thing we can be doing is keeping that energy field clean around ourselves for ourselves and everyone and everything we love. And our angelic team is a huge part of that. They really can help. I get to know myself by getting to know my guides. I, I just notice there's a lot of healers here. And then I realize, oh, I'm a healer. <laughs> or they're very communicative. Oh, I'm meant to be a communicator. So you can sort of learn what your gifts are by just um, going into a meditation, ask to be graced by the presence of the lead guide working with you right now. If you feel like I don't understand my lead guide, then you can intend, I need to hear you more clearly. You can ask for these things and receive them. Yeah. And if you feel like you don't have the help you need, you can ask for that. Like I need more assistance here. And boy, do they come through. They really do. And the more you keep showing up and facing your fears, coming through your shadow stuff, the more they're there for you too. And um, synchronicities occur. Good luck happens. Things happen that you don't even feel like you did anything. And man, good luck is happening. And so keep doing what you, um, what you're here to do. It's important to connect with them daily. Yes, it is. I really like that. I really like that. So um, in closing, just tell us some of the things that have happened to you that were like that you wrote about in your book that you, you knew there was a Mandela effect like maybe early on where, because you, you go through a lot of different things in your book that things that have happened, oh, yeah. some of them are remarkable. They incredible. Yeah. Right? So let's, right. let's just cover a few of them so folks can kind of get a feel. When I was quite young, I wasn't even an adult yet in my youth, in my childhood. Um, we, like I said, we'd travel the world. And on one of those trips, my parents promised the wood carvers in Lake Dahl, India, um, they said, we will take photos once we're, the, the furniture they ordered was very fragile. And so it was packaged and wrapped up and it was dismantled, safely wrapped, and then put on a slow boat to get to the United States many, many months later. And so my parents were, I heard, I heard them promise the woodcarvers, we'll send a picture of these tables um, when they're in our home. We'll send you a picture of how they look in our home. And the woodcarver said, thank you. And I just, I, I didn't think any, I would never have thought to make such a promise. It would never, I was a child, I, like 10 years old, wouldn't have occurred to me. I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's nice of my parents to promise that. So many, many, many months later, the the wood, the carvings arrived. My parents assembled the tables. My parents ordered um, glass um, to be cut for the, to be placed on top of the tables to protect the wood and all of that finally happened and it was all in, we, we, they'd been building a new house. Everything was in the new house. It was all set up. It looked gorgeous. And I felt like, well, I'm expecting my parents should be, I was curious, like, how are they going to take the pictures for the, send them back to Doll Lake and in Kashmir, India. And I asked my parents, um, are you going to take those pictures? And they said, what pictures? And my parents don't lie. They don't make things up. And I said, the pictures you promised the wood carvers that after the, the furniture arrived and it was all reassembled and in the new house, you were going to take pictures and send it back. He said, we never said any such thing. And that was totally, that was unmistakable to me that there was like, here we are looking at a memory from a few months earlier, like were we in different realities? And I knew for sure, because I believed them and I believed my memory. And so I knew both were right. This is extremely important. There was no doubt in my mind. Why would I make something like that up? I wouldn't have even thought of such a thing. It never, I mean, the whole thing was brand new to me. It's not like, oh, this is what we do. We travel, we buy furniture, we promise the wood carvers. No, we'd never done any of that before. So why would I have made that up? I did not make that up. So I know for sure I remembered it correctly. 
I also know for sure my parents do not lie. If they make a promise, they follow through. And that would be such an easy thing to do. It takes, it's no trouble to take pictures and put them in a letter and mail it back. I know they would have if they had made that promise. So then I knew something remarkable had just happened. Um, and then also in the 1970s, when I was a teenager, I don't remember what song it was, but I would listen to a lot of top, top 40 music on the radio on my little radio that I had. And the announcer was saying, we're about to play a brand new song. I thought, oh, finally, they, they play a lot of repetitive stuff. It'd be nice to hear a brand new song. I'm waiting for it, waiting for through the ads. Like, okay, they're going to play it. Oh, what a disappointment. They played something they'd been overplaying for at least a week, if not more. And I was so sick of that song. Like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Not that, not that. And then I asked my sister and my friend, and I don't remember the song now, but they didn't know what I was talking about. And I thought, well, I know for sure something happened here. But it was before the internet. Man, if I had the internet right then, yeah. I would, you better believe I would have posted that. Like, Anybody else notice this song is not brand new, but you heard it like weeks or months ago and you're so sick of it now? Anybody else? <laughs> and the people would say, oh, yeah. And you've had a lot of that stuff happen in your life, a lot of it. And I think it's important because it kind of wakes folks up to like pay attention, start paying attention to these things. Like I, right. I believe there are no coincidences. And, and you know, it's I, I think that we're just so living fast paced and everything is hurry up, get this done and have this to do. And we just don't, you know, we see these things, but they're just like a passing glance when they shouldn't be, right? We should start really paying attention to this stuff. Yes, it's the most important thing going on on the planet right now, because it means that when you observe something, it's not stuck in that state. Right. And so even if you think, oh, this is bad, just relax, detach energize, you know, follow whatever spiritual practice you feel called to practice and recognize we're here right now so we can walk into the golden age, the age of Shambhala. Um, this is prophesized. It, I know it looks like chaos. I know it looks like everything's falling apart. It looks like timelines are converging and crashing together. Sure. Because it is a great awakening. And that means we're all going through our shadow stuff together. And there's a lot of dirty laundry. Okay. Yes. Also, the great masters are here means those of us who know who we really are that we are consciousness itself we are here and we are at a tipping point there are enough of us who are able to be calm detached loving no matter what seems to be happening and everything can be okay and miracles are happening all the time yes. every minute yes that's great advice for folks is there a place where people can report these experiences like can they do that on your website or is there a, a repository somewhere where people yeah, I, them. I, yes, I'm I'm basically um you send it to me, you send me an email at Cynthia at realityshifters.com. I will post it. Um, what happens is I get them from around the world and I will follow it, it's not a thing where you post it, it's more like a process of interact with me because it's in relationship. And what I'll do is find I'll I'll be following up with questions. Often if if it's not clear, I'll ask what were you thinking and feeling at the time certain times things were happening because that is absolutely relevant and it might not be something you're thinking of um, and it's extremely important for the the flow of the series of events that occur mm. and do you, I'll ask with, do you with need the person yeah i like to know the location because right. i like to the place and the time what then happens is we've got a repository at realityshifters.com right 25 years of firsthand reports oh wow all with with you'll know when and where these things were happening and so it's it's just wide open for anyone to take a look at so do but you it's like um, more than than two people to have that experience or doesn't it does that doesn't matter it doesn't matter if that's the case that's great that's like carl jung with tony wolf and if you've got people I, it feels good when you're first experiencing this to have friends with you because it can feel shocking, right. really shocking to notice like that whole street is different. Do you guys notice that? And if I right. feel like, yeah, it's different, then I'm like, thank God, because I feel like I'm losing my mind otherwise. Um, and that's the kind of thing that people write about, like the entire street changed, or I went to a restaurant that doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Right. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cynthia. This, And I know we're going to be 
talking about this again um, at sometime in late November. We're definitely going to be reconnecting. There's a lot more questions. And again, folks, I'll have all the information in the description of this video, as well as running across the screen. So be sure to head over to Cynthia's website. I'll have that realityshifters.com, right? I'll have that listed as well. And she also gave us her email address. So if you have any questions or you'd like to report one of these incidences yourself, go, you can go right ahead and email Cynthia. And there's a website for our International Mandela Effect Conference, which is imec.world. And if you sign up to that newsletter, it's a different newsletter, but then you'll find out about our monthly live streams on YouTube and also our in-person events, such as we're doing in Nashville, Tennessee, in yeah. November 7th through the 10th. So exciting. Of course, I'll have all that information. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It was truly a blessing being able to connect and speak with you today. And I thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Carol Ann. Love you so, so much. Love you too. I'll be in touch soon.